Hi all, I'd like to show you another amazing game of Garry Kasparov this afternoon. This was against John Van de Will, played in the Moscow Interzonal Tournament of 1982. So Garry Kasparov had to try and win this Interzonal in order to get into the candidates to be able to challenge later Anatoly Karpov. So this was like the first stage. Let's have a look at this game, but before we do a brief intro on John Van de Will, he's a Dutch chess grandmaster awarded the GM title in 1982 so the same year as this game he was the European junior champion in 1978 and champion at the Netherlands in 1986 a participant in chess Olympiads of 1980 82 and 84 he completed in, competed in several interzonal tournaments this was the first one the Moscow 1982 uh, where he finished 11th to 12th and he also played in the bill 1985 finishing 4th to 6th his best results in other international tournaments include Sochi 1980, uh, Weekend Z 1981, 1982, Novi Sad 1982. And in the past, he was also a notable computer killer, apparently. Uh, so let's see, D4 by John van der Wille, and Kasparov played Knight F6, and we get a surprise move now. Uh, we get Bishop G5, it's actually the third most popular choice here. It's uh, popularized by British Grandmaster Julian Hodge and the Trompovsky attack. Sparov played the most popular reply, which is just knight e4, hitting the bishop. The bishop now dropped to f4, that's the main move, and now c5. Now c5 opens up the queen, and you think, well, you normally you don't want to move the queen too much in the opening, but b6 is actually a very interesting square. There's a kind of weak to the last move here that the bishop has neglected b2, and it can be to black's advantage to simply go for that b2. Uh, pawn here. There's also, of course, putting pressure on d4 pawn, which is going to be annoying. White's played here d5, in fact. The most usual move is just to play f3 to immediately kick the knight, and the game could continue with check, the knight dropping back, and like this. But uh, no, we didn't quite get that, although we could still transpose. We played, uh, John Van Der played d5. And now we get this queen b6, so it's quite annoying that this b2 pawn is being attacked. And the bishop just drops back all the way to c1. And it looks a bit strange uh, to do this, but a lot of players have played like this, because you're still going to kick the knight and get this center, which seems to be quite impressive, uh, potentially, anyway. This next move strikes at d5, though. And now we see f3. And the main move by far is actually moving the knight back. Uh, the second most popular is what Kasparov played, which is queen a5 check. So we see here uh, c3, and now the knight drops back, and now e4. So a very interesting start position indeed. So white has constructed that center. Black has uh, moved the queen a lot, but he's caused like a pawn which is not ideal on c3 here. Usually the pawn wants to go to c4 uh, to cement that central space advantage. Let's put on a bit uh, here. d6 was played, so Kasparov, he's, he's concerned about possible e5 advance. And now we see knight a3, this knight coming to c4 is going to put pressure on d6. So it's probably not wise to attempt to Fincetto given this knight c4. It's going to hit the queen and d6. We instead well, we see e takes d5 first, e takes d5, and now bishop e7, forget the finch, so the bishop is needed here to protect d6 in advance to knight c4s. Black's already doing okay in this position, apparently, from a theoretical um, engine perspective. Uh, we see knight c4, and the queen drops all the way back, actually, to d8, which you might find a little bit surprising. But make a note that this is a kind of battery, ready-made battery, if ever this bishop wants to jump out to the diagonal, it's automatically protected by the queen. So it might actually be more useful than going to c7. We see knight e3. Now Kasparov cancelled. Knight e2. Rook e8. And now a very strange move. I think many of Kasparov players seem to be a bit terrified when playing him. Uh, the engine suggestion here is not to be too concerned about this e-file just yet and play a move like knight g3 um, 
Although black would appear to be a little bit better because there has been some weaknesses generated in white's position here. But uh, you know, this sort of position seems uh, perfectly uh, playable. For example, like this, it seems playable. But we see white uh, playing a much more adventurous move, which you might gasp in horror at. It's the move G4. So he hasn't uh, castled yet. And I don't know if you might predict this, but the engine evaluation jumped a little bit down in Black's favour a bit more. It's about half a pawn after this G4 move. But I guess the proof is in the pudding. We really need to be able to prove this is a weakness, this playing this G4, playing in this way. So how does Kasparov try and prove that? Well, he plays actually knight fd7. And of course, he's got ideas that may be the checks usable, but also bishop g5, actually, supported by the queen. This ready-made battery can be made use of soon. And of course, knight e5 hits f3 as well. So it looks like quite a dangerous position already after this g4. So we see knight g3. And strategically, if we can exchange off the dark square bishops, then white will be even weaker on the dark squares. And we do see now uh, a move which is characteristic of, of types of positions where white has pawns on light squares. Black wants to exchange off dark square bishops. We see bishop g5. Of course, the bonus is that it's actually threatening to take the knight here, which something needs to be done about that urgently. And we see king f2, the king coming to support the knight. Now we see knight e5, and there's already a kind of big threat here of queen f6, which potentially is threatening bishop takes and knight takes g4, as well as keeping the queen just passive, protecting f3. Here we see bishop b5, bishop d7 is played. So why does black want to weaken the light squares? Are there any nice light square weaknesses in white's camp to use if we get an exchange of bishops here. Best apparently is, is to put the bishop back and to support f3 in advance. And this should be okay. I mean, it's only, but it's still actually better for black. But, uh, you know, bishop e2 is probably the most solid choice in the circumstance, uh, protecting f3 in advance. So something like queen f6 is not such a big deal. Maybe knight e f5. It shouldn't be such a big deal here even though uh, white seems to have weaknesses. But uh, what happened was actually bishop takes d7. And in fact, with this bishop exchange, something is very, very wrong with the white position after knight b takes d7. Black is threatening, as a very serious threat, of actually playing c4 and making it to the d3 square for what could be called an octopus knight. Uh, the, the term Octopus Knight, of course, there's a very famous uh, Karpov against Kasparov game with, with uh, Kasparov having this knight on d3. We're going to get an Octopus Knight here with this threat of c4 and knight d3. But by exchanging off the light square bishop, he's a bit weaker on the key d3 square in this position. White played knight e f5. Also, though, to note here is. Queen b6 might also be uh, another thing to worry about uh, with the idea of simply taking here and taking here is very, very annoying uh, as well. But c4 and knight d3 is very, very annoying. So, okay, in the circumstance, white probably didn't improve his position too much with knight e f5. We see c4, and this horrible knight is destined for d3. Does it matter about the pawn? It doesn't look it because of queen b6. Let's just examine this very, very quickly. Well, we have a loose bishop to take care of, but bishop takes c1, and then there's big trouble ahead. Uh, if the knight has to take here, because otherwise queen b6 check, this looks pretty hopeless after queen b6 check here. And knight d3, this looks terrible. Uh, okay, so that pawn is cannot be taken. White played actually knight h5. This is probably a very, very big blunder actually. There is a way for white uh, to avoid seriously compromising his position even more, even more. If we just put that back for a moment. Apparently if he, if white had taken on g5, queen takes g5, and now king g2, 
the trouble that white faces is is minimized, but it's still pretty bad after knight d3. This knight's got a very juicy f4 uh, square here, for example, and it it just looks like a very very pleasant position. Uh, if if knight takes d6, for example, in fact, um, even like rook e3, and now black has serious threats like knight f4 check, and even rook d3. This rook's going to be dangerous infiltrating like that. But let's go back. So in this position, though, White made things a lot, lot worse. On move twenty, he played knight h5. Now Kasparov plays knight d3 check. The king goes to g3. Now bishop takes c1. And the queen can't take. It would be nice to take to come back potentially on this diagonal, where it could be quite useful. Rook takes, offering the exchange. Uh, which looks uh, tempting, perhaps, but Kasparov has got another option here, which appears to just win material. Uh, he just plays g6 rather calmly, just just threatening to just win material. What can White do here? It looks like a total disaster. If if for example Knight takes d6. We can actually just pin that knight. We have the luxury of just of just pinning this knight, and then just taking it. And what's the big deal? There's no attack for white at all. So a complete disaster here. Why did white? Uh, what did white want to achieve in this position? If we try knight takes c1 as an alternative, then this is this is actually uh, okay. It seems technically for white, believe it or not. A move like g6 is not working so well. In fact, there's a mate in four for white here after queen h6. This is to be avoided, like the play, this sort of position. Uh, so, ignoring uh, the rook, just playing g6 here is just winning uh, material. Let's have a look at the check, for example. The check here. In this position, not king h8, and we'd lose the queen to so knight takes f7, but king f8, keeping a hold of f7 and what does white actually play here if knight f4 then knight takes f4 brings the king out it seems for a very bad position queen h4 is actually a forced mate in seven with g5 check the king cannot come out to f4 and survive uh, this position Queen d4 looks aggressive, f6. We're going to play g5 soon. So that's disaster for white. So these knights are just, they're just, one of them's being lost. Knight h6 check doesn't do anything. King f8 uh, is refutation of that. So white losing material. Just rewind back because it's such a, a, uh, an abrupt end to the game. Because actually, after g6, uh, white resigned. Um, so <laughs> that was actually the end of the game. So how did, how on earth did White play like this? You're asking, perhaps. In this position, uh, as I say, best seems to be Bishop takes g5. Uh, another move, King g2. It just seems that um, White made things a lot lot worse than perhaps they needed to be. I mean, this position is is still. Not very pleasant for white because of that octopus knight on d3, but uh, it's not immediately uh, losing, uh, although it, it looks pretty grim. It's not immediately losing. Uh, so, in the game, though, yep, we saw after bishop takes c1, rook takes c1, g6, end of game, believe it or not. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.